Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring you your fighting retrospective on UFC 242 where Khabib Nurmagomedov submitted Dustin Poirier and uh, it's going to be a little bit of a neat crow on that one. I'll have to talk about you know why my pick was wrong and, and that just kind of is what it is. 7-5 and five on the night though. We took a lot of L's uh, to you know kind of close things out. We started out really well. We were rolling pretty good and we just could not pick up the, uh, the top three fights, the ones that I really wanted to get right, and that just kind of, you know, is what it is. Let's get into it, though. It wasn't the worst night. Actually, from a betting perspective, still did okay, still came out on top, so can't really complain too much. It's just that, you know, I wanted those big fights. Anyways, let's get into it. Here's the show. <laughs> So in Abu Dhabi, Khabib retains his 155-pound crown, the big strap, the gold belt. He takes it away. He cements. The, he solidifies the 155-pound crown. We did have the interim champion. We had a you know champion, the real champion. It was Khabib at the time, and he's taken both crowns. There's no disputing anymore. He is the 155-pound king. Uh, let's talk about the fight though. So. You know, uh, the game plan that I talked about wasn't a factor at all. You know, I didn't think uh, Dustin wanted to pressure Khabib on the fence, wanted to stop those shots. In fact, Dustin was perfectly okay with backpedaling towards the cage. Um, I think he he thought that he could, um, it looked like when Khabib was going for these takedowns in the first round, that he could kind of rotate his body in a way that would have Khabib actually end up on the bottom of the takedown, thus, you know, nullifying his uh, takedown ability and and kind of making him pay for it. Uh, that just didn't play out, though. Um, Khabib's technique was just way too good. Dustin said this in the press conference. Uh, he didn't say he was stronger than anybody's grapple with. And, you know, from the guys down at top team, I didn't think, you know, especially he's going up with guys that are bigger than Khabib, I didn't think strength would be a factor here. But his technique, you know, he's one of the best grapplers in the world, especially this MMA world. And, uh, you know, he uh, he made Dustin pay for it, especially in that first round. But I thought that was a little ace in the hole here. You know, when I saw Connor could be first round, I thought Connor looked more tired. I thought Connor had to, uh, you know, expel a lot more energy against Khabib to shut down those takedowns or do as much prevention and defense as possible. I thought Dustin looked really good. In fact, I talked a little bit of shit to him. I don't know what he said, uh, but he talked a little bit of shit to him when they actually broke away for the end of the first round. Coming out to the second, and this one, man, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe Dustin feels more heavily about the uh, the submission later on that we're going to get to. But in the second round, Dustin rocks Khabib. And uh, I was I was at a venue. Uh, I was at a Buffalo Wild Wings. I'll just say where I was. And I, I just, you know, for anything in life, if you know me personally, uh, I tend to strap myself into the roller coaster of whatever event I'm watching. It could be a MLS game that I really, you know, ultimately don't care about who wins or loses. And I'm there screaming and chanting and just getting all tribal uh, for the occasion. And I just put myself into it. And, you know, I ride the highs, I ride the lows. And then after it's done, you know, you just got to kind of move on. This one, though, has sat with me a little bit. I was feeling a lot of empathy for Dustin uh, up until, you know, late yesterday. I've kind of slept it off. I feel better now. And I'm sure Dustin does, too. And, uh, you know, I have, I have no stake in this, you know, no real stake, just, uh, just, you know, the pride of making the picks and a little bit of money behind it. Uh, but Dustin's the guy that has, you know, the real consequences. And I always like to make that clear, you know, for, for anything I say, you know, that I screwed up or this or that, you know, it, it's these guys and, and they're really the ones to, uh, you know, pay the most respect to and, and, uh, you know, everything that they do. Anyways, Dustin, you know, he, he rocks. Khabib and I'm in the wild wings I'm screaming put him down put him down put him down like, I just was so into it I was smelling the blood I thought that Dustin could too but in the press conference he said he just didn't kind of like go forward for it you know um, and he also made a comment that Khabib is very good about hiding you know damage that he takes he's very good at uh, monitoring bullshit you know he uh, he will basically make you believe he isn't as hurt as he is and um, I think this is now twice, you know, the Michael Johnson fight and now the Poirier fight. And if fighters crack this guy, I think you really, you know, just knowing how good he is and how few opportunities you get, you kind of got to throw caution to the wind and smother and smother a guy like this and, and just go for it. 
Um, the only one that I think we really saw engage uh, him in any kind of way was, was Connor. Connor on the feet, I think, came forward. He never cracked him, though, and I think that was kind of his problem. But I think if Connor did crack him, I think he would have he would have gone in. And Dustin, I thought he was going to, too, and he wobbled him. You could see his feet were going there a little bit, and Dustin just couldn't get there, couldn't shut the door, couldn't hold him on the cage, couldn't stop him from escaping. And, uh, you know, he just he just could not get it done and I don't think it was a fight IQ thing I think it was in the moment thing a pressure thing uh, maybe it was that first round psychologically that he didn't have anything for him that he thought he was losing the fight that he tried to you know keep it going find a better opportunity but sometimes when these opportunities come you got to capitalize on them and so up until this point in the fight you know we saw Khabib's fight but Khabib when he's just kind of pounding you you know especially like he was in the first round and playing his game there's not really a threat there you know like Yes, there is, but it's not. It doesn't. It's not a big finishing threat. You know, he, we don't see him go for many submissions, and a lot of times his ground and pound is really just a, a grinding ground and pound. It, it doesn't never, never really seems like he's trying to finish it like some guys do. Anyways, uh, so obviously, you know, Khabib recovers there, and uh, Poirier is, uh, you know, back on his back. He's he's on the he's on the ground, and I, I think that was, you know an opportunity to slip through his fingers. He never really was able to hurt Khabib again, especially uh, in any kind of stand-up situation. Then we go to the third round, and this is the one that Poirier, I guess, you know, he's going to have to live with the rest of his life is what he said. But, uh, you know, he's not listening to this. But if you were, I'd say, you know, just just get back out there, man. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't rewrite that wrong that you made. And so you can just get better from it and learn from it. And, and that's all there is to it. Uh, so he gets Khabib in a guillotine on a takedown. And... I actually thought this was the second time in this fight that Poirier had him dead to rights. I really did. I really did. I was actually expecting Khabib to go limp. I never expected him to tap in Abu Dhabi. Never expected him to tap at all. And, you know, he, he gets him. He has that one leg over. I was I was even paying attention to the fact that he didn't pull guard. Like, I wasn't screaming, you know, pull guard, pull guard. I mean, I was caught up in the moment of it that... That this thing was tight. This is the most dangerous situation Khabib has ever been in. You know, um, RDA had him with a you know kind of a weakish guillotine. Um, a lot of guys have grabbed his head, but nobody's really really had one on him like this. You know, great crank in the neck, putting everything he had into it. Uh, Dustin was, and he he just didn't wrap up the other leg. He didn't get maximum leverage. He let Khabib escape, and he paid the price. You know, he, I think he really went for that squeeze, burned his arms out a bit, especially in the third round. I mean, this, this guy had already been going heavy for 10 minutes and uh, put everything he had into it and did not have enough to stave off Khabib once he got back. You know, Khabib took his back and he locked up that rear naked choke so beautifully. You could see, you could see like it was years of practice and training and he calmly cinched it in. I mean... It, it was amazing. I mean, the, the motion that he cinched in that rear naked choke was beautiful. And uh, that's what he used to retain his 155-pound crown. So I guess this brings us to kind of the future side of things because I kind of talked about that in the last episode. So that's, this is, I think, where the division has to stand. Uh, Khabib fights Tony. You know, um, he has to fight Tony. And, and that, I think, is the only real way to do it at, at this point. You know, you gotta you gotta sign that fight. I don't know when it is. Khabib seemed fairly healthy. I don't think he took too much damage uh, from Poirier. So I think you go on. He fights. Uh, he fights Tony. Then we got Connor's situation. Uh, Connor wants to come back. I think his only real comeback situation right now is to fight the winner of Gaethje Cowboy. That's his best bet to get in the rematch. On Twitter yesterday, he was like, "Book the rematch in Moscow." He's basically saying, "I don't give an f." I don't care where it is. I just want it. He hasn't really earned it. He's got to fight somebody. Had Poirier won, I think it would have been fair for them to fight. No title, you know, no, nothing to hold anybody hostage with. No maybe crazy, crazy buildup. Just let the guys go back at it and just do it. And uh, that's gone. Now. That's that's not happening. Um, could potentially happen after uh, Tony fights. You know, something could happen there. But I think ultimately Connor has to fight somebody now. And I think it's going to be the winner of Cowboy Gaethje. I think next week we find out what's going on, and I think that's the fight to make. Um, as far as the rest of the division, uh, we got we got Felder calling out calling out Connor. I think that's actually a good fight for him too. Uh, I don't think it really cements him as a guy that can fight for the title, though. Unfortunately, 
by beating Paul Felder at this point, especially after that split decision against Barboza. And we'll get into that one. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's the fight to make. I think it's a good fight for Connor. I think that's, and this isn't a real knock on Felder, but I think, I think you know, stylistically, that's Connor's real best chance at winning. You know, he's not as tough as Gaethje and um, not necessarily as dynamic, in my personal opinion, as Cowboy. I think he's a good fight for sure. Uh, and Poirier, I'm not sure where Poirier goes from here either. You know, it's uh, it's kind of tough. You get guys like Gregor Gillespie coming up as well. You have Islam Makashev calling out Felder. So a lot, a lot of things are shuffling right now. I think it's really interesting to see where it is. But I think the Connor situation is fighting the winner of Cowboy and Gaethje. I think the Tony situation, the title situation, is for him to fight Khabib. And then everything else just gets shuffled back into the mix. And that's where I think things stand at this moment. A lot of it's up in the air. The only thing I think we have for certain is Tony. I think it has to be Tony. And if anybody is going to stop, he's going to prevent Khabib from getting to the final boss known as GSP. That's how his career seems like it's going. Uh, I think it's going to be Tony. Tony Ferguson, Tony won Kenobi, your only hope. All right, moving on to another L here. We had Paul Felder defeat Edson Barboza. And this one I was kind of scratching my head about. I'm not really sure where I stand on this one as far as uh, fights go. You know, um, Paul Felder is outstruck. He's not taken down. Uh, sorry, he scores no takedowns. Meanwhile, Barboza outstrikes him, except in the third round by four strikes overall, and scores a takedown that I thought did damage. I am not sure where the referees were on this one. Edson Barboza did get tired in the third, and Felder exploited that. But Felder lost the first two rounds. You know, I, I don't see how he was able to pick up a victory here. You know, Barboza was, was pissed as well. You know, he just exited the cage right away. It was a bullshit call. No other way to put it. Uh, Paul Felder did not win that fight. Was it a close fight? Sure. Uh, I'll say it was a close fight. It's a Barboza in the first two rounds. Only outstruck him by a few. But I thought he did more damage to him, you know. And maybe they were, the judges were discounting some of the damage because of the headbutt. Maybe they thought the blood that was there was strictly from that, that all the damage was strictly from that, and they didn't think Barboza did much. That's my only guess. Or they just weren't watching the fight at all, and they were just excited for Khabib to fight in the next one. Um, you know, I, I don't I, I don't know how it happened. One of the fighters, or sorry, one of the judges scored it 27, th- sorry, 30-27. I don't know how the hell that happens. Even Dana White was confused. So just a really bad call overall. Um, you know, in some ways I can see, you know, hey, Felder did put in a great performance. Could he have won? Sure. You know, I can be wrong, but 30-27. I mean, come on. That's ridiculous. The, the second, maybe the second round. No, the second round is when Barboza scores the takedown and beats him up on the ground for a bit. She plays a little ground and pound. Was it the most devastating ground and pound? No, but it was right in the middle of the cage. <laughs> Felder didn't try to get to the fence. You know, he was just playing guard and stopping blows, and Barbos was dropping elbows and hands when he could. And yeah, I don't know how this one plays out. Uh, I've even thought about taking this one out of, you know, kind of the big ongoing metric I have here now for, for back testing because I don't, I don't know if Barbosa deserved to lose in this one. But, hey, you know, that's just the way it goes. I got to... Gotta accept an L here. One of the one of the W in this one, especially. I remember sitting there watching, going, "Okay, I, I gotta win there." And they're like, "Paul Irish Dragon Felder," and I'm like, "What the hell? Robbery, <laughs> robbery? Maybe not a robbery, but um, I think a lot of people just like Felder. I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. And so a lot of people, I think, didn't agree with me staying robbery, but I, I come down the middle on these a little bit more. I I just back the guys that I like statistically. Uh, and so hey, is what it is. All right, moving on, Islam Makachev, Davi Hamos. So this one I was not happy with at all. Uh, this one just gave me blue balls for days. First two rounds, I mean, neither one of these guys is an exceptional striker. Like I said in the podcast, Hamos is not a better striker than Makachev, and I think we saw that even in rounds one and two when not much happened. You know, I think we saw Makachev have a little bit faster hands, a little bit heavier hands, and Hamos looked outclassed. Um, you know, Hamos stuffed the takedown from Makachev early, but never went for any of his own, never tried to play his game. I think Makachev would have been interested in playing his game, you know, especially if Hamos had had top position. I think that would have been an interesting rule reversal there. Um, and then in the third round, you know, what I thought was a close fight, 
Uh, Hamos just gets knocked down or trips. He's going back to the cage. Makachev's hitting him with a flurry of punches. I'm not sure if it was an actual knockdown or if it was just a trip because he was trying to go back and uh, he was going straight back, which is a problem. He could kind of rotate out of those. But um, Makachev gets him on the ground. They spend about three and a half minutes in Hamos's guard. Hamos was trying. You know, he was going for arm bars. He uh, looked like he was trying to slide the arm in to go for a triangle. Um, going for, you know, your traditional BJJ moves, uh, your traditional submissions. And he wasn't really able to get any of those. None of those um, really looked too close. I mean, I'm sure if I was in his guard, um, I would <laughs> anything with him, I'm sure, is too close for comfort. But... Uh, he, uh, he was not able to get it done, not able to threaten Makachev and, uh, you know, maybe if he, maybe if he had a gi jacket on, he could have done something, but, <laughs> uh, anyways, almost picks up an L here and, uh, we do too. Moving on to the next, Curtis Blades defeats Shamil Aperdukhamov. So he's a takedown machine. I said it. He only threw 25 strikes, uh, five takedowns. So 20% of this fight was just him taking him down. Uh, he ends up picking up a TKO, which I, I've said it before. His ground and pound isn't really the best, but it's gotten better. So he TKOs Shamil, and uh, we got that one right. He was a heavy favorite, so I kind of expected that one as well. Uh, and the next one, Diego Ferreira defeats Merbek Tysimov. So I did get this one correct. Uh, Ferreira looked very much in trouble in the first round. However, he was able to regain and outstrike Merbek 2-1. to one. So first round looked a little bit rough, a little bit concerned. Then in rounds 2 and 3. I mean, by the end, by the middle of the third round, I was already like, all right, Diego's pretty much locked this up. Tysimov looks really tired. I don't think he's going to be able to really do much here, except for maybe, um, you know, a weak takedown. Maybe he gets it, maybe he doesn't. Um, but I think Ferreira kind of locked it up. And he did. He picked up the W here via unanimous decision. In the next matchup that I was not able to actually see, uh, we had a split decision. Looks kind of like a weird split decision. So Joanne Calderwood outstrikes Andrea Lee, 101 to 61. Of course, two takedowns of her own to Andrea Lee's three. And it seems like it should have been relatively unanimous for Andrea Lee. I'm uh, sorry, for Joanne Calderwood in this one. I don't think Andrea Lee, uh, by the ending numbers here, I didn't see the fight. Uh, maybe she did more damage. It didn't look like it should have been a split decision. But JoJo picks up a W here. We do too. She was a uh, she was a good pick uh, as far as the betting goes. So I was happy with that one. And uh, hey, wasn't too bad. And the next one, we actually had a draw. So uh, we had uh, Zabara Tukov take on Lerone Murphy. And this one's kind of weird in my opinion as well. So uh, it's only weird because Zubara scored six takedowns on the event. Uh, yet it comes to a draw. Um, it's a, you know, a low striking affair, 22 and 28 strikes for each guy. Um, we had two submission attempts by Murphy. So maybe that's how we ended up in a situation where, you know, maybe those takedowns were slightly nullified. Uh, didn't get to see it. Um, but, uh, that's how it played out. And the next one we got correct. We had Sarah Morris defeat Liana Jojua. And this one was uh, TKO elbows, middle of the third round. Looked like Morris had the superior stand-up, although Jujua was able to pick up the takedowns and kind of nullify that, but uh, ultimately was not enough, was not able to pick up a W. And so we ended up getting that one correct. All right, in the next one that I did not get correct, we had Bala Muhammad defeat Takashi Sato. Sato was a big, heavy underdog here, so... Um, I didn't realize that when I picked him, but I would have been very happy if he had he won, but that's just not the way it played out. Bilal just looked really sharp. Sato looked tough as hell. I mean, he was eating a lot of combinations. Um, Bilal just looked really, really sharp. Um, Sato wasn't really throwing. I mean, he would he basically nail him with a straight, but he couldn't tie any other punches together to continue to pierce his guard. And so when you're only throwing really one punch at a time, even when it's landing, it's just not going to be enough. Uh, whereas Bilal was throwing, you know, three, four punch combinations that ended in leg kicks. Uh, he would just look really good that night. Um, great spinning back kicks. Uh, he just looked phenomenal. I'm not sure, you know, uh, you know, where Bilal got it. Maybe it was being in Abu Dhabi. Maybe he just enjoyed, uh, his contestant that he was fighting, but he looked way sharper than ever. And, uh, I think good things for Bilal are coming for him. In another one that we were able to get correct, we had a Muslim Salikov defeat Nordin Talib. So not too much to say about this one. Uh, ends via KO in the first round. Um, I thought Nadine looked uh, a little bit tight, a little bit stiff, 
and uh, Salikov just looked looser and better out there. Um, when I was watching the fight at home at the time, uh, I was actually uh, I was saying to my wife, I was like, I was like, he should really get off the cage, circle out of there. This will look good. And boom, <laughs> Muslim Salikov lands just a nasty right hand, and he's out basically before he hits the deck. Uh, so. Talib uh, picks up an L. Uh, sorry, yeah, Talib picks up an L, but we pick up a W on that one. All right, in the next matchup, we had Omari Akhmedov defeat Zach Cummings. This is one I did call correctly. Um, I didn't see most of the fight here, but it looked like Akhmedov with the takedowns and the grinding style was able to pull it off here. And then our last event, we had Don Madge defeat Farasiam, and this is another one we did call correctly, although this was actually a debuting fight. Uh, oh, also, I missed one that I did actually get wrong in the debuting as well. We have Ottoman uh, Azatar defeat Tamu Pakalin, and this was apparently like a fight of the night because um, they had that crazy knockout by Ottoman. So hats off to him. Picked up an L on that one. Riz's debuter. Uh, those are a little bit tougher to crunch. Although tonight, it uh, seemed like it was about equal. Uh, stats, no stats. We did uh, kind of okay uh, overall for, for both, although I would like to do a little better on the full stat fights. Anyways, is what it is. I'm not too upset about it. Like I said, it came out on top as far as the betting goes. So I would have liked, uh, you know, a big payday uh, for the betting. But, hey, it is what it is. I'm sure you'd like it too. But, uh, hey, coming out on top and getting more right than we get wrong is the objective here. We're about statistical, long-term, successful betting. And uh, 75 keeps with that trend. Does bring the average down a little bit, but it keeps with the trend. And so we're still picking in the 60%. We're still doing pretty well. Uh, we just got to pump those numbers up. And I think we're going to be able to do it as we go forward with this new system that I've developed. So speaking of that new system and things to come, we have Cowboy Gaethje next week. The rest of the card is looking okay. I don't have any real big fight aside from the main event that stands out in my mind. Uh, we got the Teixeira Krylov fight. That one's maybe going to be okay. Glover's a little over the hill. Nikita Krylov is looking pretty good recently, though. I think this is actually going to be a pretty good fight for him. He's coming off a great win over Ovin St. Preux, but did have some losses to Jan Blaskovic and Misha Serkinov. Granted, Glover's a lot older. Um, he is salty, but he's a lot older, and I'm not sure he'll be able to you know, do the same thing that the young guys can to him. Um, but uh, I, I do like Krylov. Well, <laughs> I've, I've crunched the fights, uh, but I don't want to talk. We'll talk about the next podcast. I do like I do like Krylov, though. Uh, I'll give you that one. Uh, then we have, uh, let's see, Antonio Carlos Jr., shoe face, taking on Uriah Hall. Great contest there. I'm looking forward to that one. I do enjoy Jimmy Crute, so I'm going to be looking forward to him. Mason Tibera, Augustus Kai, actually not the worst fight, especially at heavy. Um, Brad Catone is going to be on this one as well, and Chaz Skelly. Um, it's like Brad Catone is fighting his guy Hunter Azure. That's going to be okay. And Chaz Skelly taking on Jordan Griffin. Also, we got Luis Smoke out there. You know, it's not the worst card in the world. It's pretty good. In fact, we have no debuting fights on this card. So the UFC did stack it with some, you know, good talent. Some, you know, nobody... Um, unknown in this one and i think it actually could be pretty good it's just not going to blow your hair back with the names you know you got Soroni and gaichi those are the big draws and then everybody else i think is just going to be a really solid contest if you are a fan of mma you're going to enjoy watching this one but it's not going to be like you know uh the card we have coming up in november now where we got all the fighters at msg um, although we're not getting that welterweight championship, I guess. So it just kind of is what it is. But we are getting the baddest, M you know, the BMF championship between Diaz and Masvidal at this point. Uh, we're also getting Darren the Gorilla Till coming back, taking on Kelvin Gaslam. I'm really excited for that one. And that one's a few months away, but I can, oh man, I can feel that one in my bones. That one's going to be amazing. All right, so that's going to do it for this episode of The Fighting Spirit. Uh, so you can get in touch with us at FightingSpiritPodcast at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with me on Twitter at MMAFightPicks01. And you can get in touch with the show really even through YouTube comments. Like, subscribe to us there. Uh, your podcast platform of choice, all the fun spots where you can get the show. Uh, so let's see, what else here? Um, we have the Patreon as well. You can head on over to our Patreon in the description down below. Support the show at a dollar amount that makes the most sense to you. Uh, we have a couple of tiers out there, and uh, you know you get to participate in our liquor reviews, you get to participate uh, or get some information on the fight picks. 
Uh, and uh, you also could have your uh, own name and information read on the show. we got a fair number of listeners here, so anybody that wants to advertise is more than welcome to join that one up. It's a good subscription-level model. I think it's a good value for everyone that wants to take part. All right, uh, let's see. What else, what else, what else? I'm going to be recording, I think, a liquor review today. We're going to have one of those coming out pretty soon. I think on this Thursday we'll have another one, so... Try to get that in the can, and uh, yeah, I was trying to give you guys a little bit of a ramble. You know, maybe maybe somebody likes it, maybe somebody doesn't. All right, I will speak with you again, probably on the liquor review, if not on the retrospective to Cowboy versus Gaethje. I believe taking place in Vancouver. Yeah, gonna be Vancouver, British Columbia, up in Canada. That one's gonna be a nice event. I like it. Until I speak with you again next time, though. Happy fight picking.